Building a new voice network from scratch is an opportunity of a lifetime. Not many of us get the opportunity, but our featured guest is going to share his experience in architecting and implementing a fully VoIP-based network from the ground up in the fast-growing African nation of Namibia. Core elements of any VoIP network are the domestic and international switching and billing functions, knowing where to send each call and ensuring that you make money from passing the call. So stay with us as we're going to be taking a closer look at these two important functions, learning about the integration between SBCs and billing systems at Paradas. Let's start with a few introductions. I'm Alan Percy, the CMO for Telco Bridges and the host for today's um, call. And I'm just thrilled to have you join us in this very special session. Our featured guest is Ricky Innes, a voice and mobile architect for Paradas. Ricky is responsible for the design and construction of the completely new voice and LTE network in Namibia. He also manages the ongoing performance and operation of the network. And Ricky joins us from the Pradas headquarters in Windhoek, Namibia. And Ricky, thanks for taking the time to share your story today. We're looking forward to it. Thank you, Yellen. I'm glad to be part of this webinar. Great. Glad to have you. And also joining us is Mike Stukelin. He's the VP of Sales at Gerasoft, a leading provider of billing solutions for telecom and IoT providers around the globe. Mike and Gerasoft are longtime alliance partners with Telco Bridges and have many joint customers. And Mike, thanks for joining us again. Thank you very much, Ellen. It's a pleasure and thank you for the opportunity. All right, so let's move on and get to our agenda here. All right, a couple of things we're gonna cover. Um, we're gonna start out with a, uh, just a quick overview of uh, the companies that are involved and some of the background. Uh, and then we're gonna move in and talk about some of the um, specifics on Paradas and their, uh, their project in Namibia kind of give you an overview on that, uh, get into some of the details. And we've got some questions that we're gonna be uh, posing to, uh, to Ricky, getting into the details of his network. Um, it's a little different format from a lot of webinars. It's gonna be free flowing. My hope is that uh, if you pose questions along the way, I can jump in and uh, we can include those as part of the discussion. So, you know, we kind of envision this as like a panel discussion at a conference, you know, feel free just drop your question in there as we go along here and we'll, we'll try to slip them in. Uh, also too, then we're gonna wrap up with a, a little bit more detail on some of the solutions that we talked about during the event. And then uh, if there's any other questions, we'll, we'll address those. And then uh, we'll wrap up with some where to learn more as we go along. So with that, let's, uh, let's move on. And uh, I want to just start out with a, just a, a real brief overview of who Telco Bridges is. You know, I always look at the pre-registration list. There's always some new fr new faces, uh, and we're so glad you joined us. And just a quick overview of Telco Bridges. Uh, you know, our primary role is to manufacture VoIP media gateways, signaling gateways, and other gateway elements for the network. Uh, we also uh, have a line of session border controllers, which you're going to learn about today. Uh, and we focus primarily on the service provider and, and the telecom operator space. The company's privately held and is very profitable, uh, headquartered in Boucherville, uh, Canada, which is just across the river from Montreal. And that's where we have all our hardware and software development. Uh, administrative offices are all there, uh, where final assembly and some of the other functions of our, our gateways are done. We also have sales and support offices, uh, not only in, in Boucherville, but also uh, my home office here in Buffalo, New York but uh, we also have a facility in Hong Kong, Turkey, and Vietnam, and that gives us an opportunity to do our 24 seven technical support uh, around the globe. So that's about Telco Bridges. So Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about Gerasoft? Hey, Dun. Um, Gerasoft is a um, engineering company, purely an engineering company, uh, built by a team of engineers starting in 2005. Uh, right now, we're a company that is uh, located in uh, Europe. Uh, we're fairly spread out. I myself am based in Boston as a um, sales office. Uh, we make and uh, support a uh, billing solution uh, that integrates well with a number of uh, telco switches. Uh, and uh, we, are, we have been a partner of uh, Telco Bridges for, I would say, about uh, 10 years now. 
uh, we are, uh, as an engineering company, essentially in business of uh, supporting our customers in telco businesses and IoT businesses and uh, trying to allow them to do their business while taking over the technical responsibilities uh, for the billing solution. Awesome. All right. Thanks. All right. I wanted to also share, uh, um, Ricky asked me to kind of give you a quick overview of Paratus from some investment uh, materials that they uh, they have on their website. So I'm just going to quick read this off here. Um, Paratus Namibia was founded in 2005 and is listed on the Namibian Stock Exchange. It's 100% Namibian owned and holds a class a comprehensive telecommunications service license. Paratus Namibia believes in investing in its own infrastructure is critical to remaining competitive, meeting customer demand, and complying with stringent quality of service expectations. By providing the national network services through different access technologies and partner networks, Paratus offers resilience and redundancy where always on connectivity is essential. With various access technology offerings from fiber to microwave and mobile LTE, Paratus customers can rest assured that the network is stable, reliable, and can scale with capacity requirements while providing redundancy, disaster recovery, and route diversity to ensure maximum uptime. Paratus Namibia also hosts its digital orbit tracking satellite earth station in Vinhook and can connect uh, customers directly to the fiber backbone, thus delivering connectivity uh, nationwide or worldwide or nationwide. With a full suite of satellite products, Paratus offers a cust a remote customers internet connectivity, telephony, point of sale connectivity, and a fully tailored Wi-Fi voucher system for guest lodges and farms. Paratus Namibia has recently been selected as a landing partner for the Equino Undersea Cable System and will soon be completing the first ever carrier neutral data center in Namibia. And so congratulations, Ricky, and the rest of the team. That's quite an accomplishment and quite a Quite an overview. Thank you, Ellen. All right, so Ricky, I was hoping we could start out with uh, maybe just give us a quick overview of uh, Paratus as a, as a corporate entity, and then we can zero in a little bit on what you're doing in Namibia. Yeah, okay, thank you, Ellen. Um, first, the last two parts on, on your introduction, I just want to rectify that quickly. Um, we have landed the table of Google, it's called the Equano Cable. So that has been recently launched in April, I believe, April this year. And we have ignited the fiber already and we're providing a fiber connectivity services for the rest of Africa through the, through the Equano Cable. Then our data center also called Arbara, that has also been launched last year and we live with our data center and that, says, that project has also been, been completed with Paratus. So, so we have got a winner neutral data center. Uh, in terms of the group structure, I will just highlight uh, very quickly the, some of the countries. Paratus have in-country operations inside uh, Angola, Botswana, DRC, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, Zambia. I'm particularly, uh, I'm located in Namibia, in Vunduk, and uh, also the headquarters is running from Namibia mainly. So all the other countries is, uh, is, is off coast. So that's why we will see on the, on the slide that you see in front of you, you will see that uh, Paratus Namibia is almost providing almost all the services that is presented there. So we provide fiber to the home, uh, fiber to the business. We've got WAN and MPLS solutions, ST wan solutions. We have got wireless solutions, uh, point to multi-point solutions. Satellite, we actually provide satellite services to over 26 countries um, where we've got partners that is uh, looking after the satellites in, in those countries. Uh, we've got data center uh, location, co-location here in Namibia, as you know, uh, that we've got our own uh, data center. Uh, we've got cloud services. Uh, we provide cloud service solutions and disaster recovery for all our customers. We've got a full uh, mobile uh, data network it's at the moment it's data only on 4G. So it's not doing any voice, but it's also to provide all the data services. And then we've got the last part is voice. Uh, we have voice over IP. We've got a couple of business customers, hospitals, banks, a uh, couple of customers that is, that is on our voice over IP network. And uh, we offer the similar services also in Botswana in terms of VoIP and also in Angola. You can go to the next. 
So yeah, this um, diagram, the, our group is particularly proud of this diagram. Uh, and this is just to show you uh, a wide overview of where we've got points of presence. So you, as you can see, everything is being managed from Namibia, some of it is being managed from Luanda, and some of the guys in Gaborone is also having access to all these points of presence. So we've got points of presence in South Africa, Cape Town, Johannesburg, we've got all the way up to Dar es Salaam. Uh, we've got point of presence in Europe, uh, Lisbon and London, uh, in Amsterdam, um, and then in North America and in Miami, and then somewhere in South America, I can't Fortaleza. Yes, so, so and what you can see is uh, the diagram basically shows you the fiber connectivity uh, is the Iguano cable in the big red is connecting to Swakopmund, landing at the cable landing station and then connects to the transcalari fiber of Parata's own built fiber through Namibia all the way to Botswana and to the, to the rest of Africa. And go. Yeah. And there's a few, um, a little bit more detailed look inside Namibia. Yes. Um, what, you, what you will see here in Namibia is basically, um, based on the slide, we have got about 203 uh, people employed here in Namibia. Uh, the transcalari fiber that Paratus have installed is extending over 4,000 kilometers. We've got a, uh, 84, 84 plus points of presence. Uh, we just recently learned the Iguano cable of Google in Namibia and for Africa, basically. We've got a 24 seven uh, network operation center here uh, operated in Namibia. Obviously our opcos also having their own network operating centers in. In, in Botswana and in, in Angola for uh, as well. And then uh, the data center, we have launched a data center also last year, fully networked neutral data center. And, and on top of this uh, infrastructure, we provided all the services that I mentioned earlier, the LTE fiber data center services, VZ, telephony cabling services, cloud and sd -WAN. All right, so we're going to move on uh, and kind of move to this uh, kind of Q&A discussion section here uh, where we can have an opportunity to um, uh, get into some of the details. So, um, Ricky, let's start out with just a discussion of how did, how did Paratus get started with voice? I mean, let's talk about before this network that we're, we're going to talk about some of the details. Start out before the, all that, um, you know, start the story from there. Okay, um, the voice of Parata started uh, in 2013. It was a year before I started with Paratas. And at uh, that time, uh, Paratas got issued the license. Uh, they received the, um, the regulator license, the uh, class ECN and ECNS license, which stands for Electronic Communication Network Services and Electronic Communication Services license from the, from the regulator, communication regulator of, uh, of Namibia. And uh, Parata started to see an opportunity to start providing VoIP services because that was something new for Namibia. Uh, Namibia is a legacy telecoms that was running on the SS7 and TDM networks and stuff. So we saw an opportunity to, to, to start providing voice services over, over IP. And uh, the other opportunity that they also started to see was to, to bring in voice, uh, voice from from uh, the international partners like Big PCW into the country for, for let's say, uh, more convenient over voice over IP instead of mm -hmm. uh, connecting the E1 channels all the way to these, these uh, voice partners that they were having. So that's how they started to, uh, to that's how voice started in Namibia, basically. Yeah. Right. And I, and I think when we talked earlier, you mentioned that, um, if, at first, you built a, a bit of a proof of concept of some of the voice services, and um, you had some scaling issues. So maybe can you can you talk about that for for a moment? Yeah. Uh, so um, the original voice platform was built on free switch. Actually, it was actually run on free switch for, for quite some time. So uh, when the when the engineer uh, way back started the Dion Vermilion 
uh, is that uh, the voice department or voice uh, networking uh, is that to deploy the free switch, free switch platforms in a, in, a, in a redundancy fashion, just local redundancy. And uh, on top of it, it was running ISTPP. ISTPP is also open source billing system. I think it's been managed somewhere from India. Um, and then uh, we had OpenSubs as our kind of SPC and load balancing layer on top of uh, on top of these free switch platforms. And uh, it was, you can call it a proof of concept, but you know what normally happens with proof of concepts. It goes live, we start making money and then it's run for some time. Then you start getting scalability problems where you start getting failures in, in, in experience all these kind of things. As your customer starts growing in the demands, and then the demand starts picking up, then you, then you realize, oh my word, there's so much other issues into, into handling this platform and, and new features that we want and it doesn't scale well. So, so that's where we started to look for other, other vendors and see how we can more stabilize the voice environment. Right. Right, which kind of leads us to the next question: Is why a session porter controller? So, yeah. Uh, so you know, architecturally, right? Yes. Uh, so, Yellen, um, uh, the SPC was a quite a new concept for us uh, in the very beginning. We basically used Fortinet firewalls to firewall the voice part of us, and then uh, when uh, not putting it, uh, the first one was uh, Juniper firewalls. And then at some point, our Juniper firewalls decided to fail and we bring it out in Fortinet firewalls. And then we started to realize, but this Fortinet is not fully VoIP aware. So what is there in the market that is VoIP aware, voice over IP aware? And then uh, I came across your videos in 2019 and all the, doing all my research. Uh, going out trying to find out uh, what is an SPC and I think you've got a video actually what is an SPC that actually states it what is an SPC and then you just speak about SPC function and then I say oh wow uh, this is actually the firewall for VoIP and that's that's how we started to go into the SPC doing some lots of research in, in SPC and then eventually after I um, did go out on some sort of RFP, evaluating a couple of other SPC products out there in the market, uh, Pro SPC was just the most cost effective and well positioned one. In addition, you offered a free SPC, which I can build my concept uh, from the beginning on. And I could see, oh, but this can work. And there was, I think it was about 30 days that I can use all the features. Mm -hmm. of the SPC, like the APIs and, 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 and the only done one plus one features on, on the free SPC and it was just working uh, uh, perfectly. Um, and uh, that's where I started to transgress and, and change out the open subs layer with, with, with the pro SPC layers just to, to test it. We were still maintaining our free switch and ASTPP layers, but uh, that's where I started to slot in uh, because we've got live customers, uh, Ellen, right, and right. Uh, and the you have to do this in a pace approach. So I started to replace the open subs, get rid of the command line interfaces of open subs, and, and just getting a pro SPC something that can interconnect with the rest of the world and and enter the firewall, and then we cut out the Fortinet firewall basically from there. Good, good. Yeah, and uh, we'll probably get in, in a couple of questions here. We'll be talking about the architecture and, and the layout yeah. of your network. So we'll, uh, yeah. we'll get into some more detail. So now let's move on to the other half of the equation, which is, um, so let's talk about the billing side. You know, you've, you've, I think when you first got started, uh, you had some challenges with trying to figure out how to capture the cost and, the, and some of the traffic. And maybe maybe you could explain that today. Yeah, yeah. Um... Uh, initially, we used the free switch CDRs, so uh, we focused on the JSON CDRs of free switch. So basically, a file was generated for each and every call, mm -hmm. uh, for each and every leg to be in, uh, to be more specific. And it was just a lot of files going to the polling engine and the rating, and we started to get mismatches with our interconnect partners and all these kind of things. And we started and, and we required a better system to manage this billing and information for us in, in, right. in, in more real time instead of getting every 15 minutes from the FTP server, the JSON CDRs and then rating. 
So, and I mean, if you know uh, nowadays with, with internet, everything is so fast. If people get hacked, um, they, we will only realize 40 minutes or an hour later once we have, uh, once we have uh, immediated those CDRs and stuff and translated into mm -hmm. num dollars or, or something in order to see, then we will see, oh, we need to block this customer or we need to do this or, or something has happened. Uh, so, uh, so there was a there was a real need for a real time billing system, and that's what started to drive me to do more research. And I came across on on your website, actually on your partner alliance list, on your website, I saw right. Gerasoft, and that's how I started to dig into Gerasoft. And I said, okay, uh, maybe I should look into deeper. It's how sure. me and Mike started to to start chatting. Yeah, well, that leads right to the next question, which is. How are you accomplishing billing today? And I, and I think it would be really informative to talk about, you know, the prepaid, postpaid kind of model that you have to deal with, uh, and also, you know, the the revenue protection. So, you know, give us a quick overview. How, how, what what are those modules, and and how does that work uh, for for your company? All right. Uh, so basically, Gerasoft is now the center in our billing, and what we're doing uh, with Gerasoft is uh, we before we started to deploy JiraSoft, the first thing first that we started to assess, can it do customer billing? Will it be able to do credit control for us, for, for the various customers? Can it integrate or realize who is our interconnects or vendors, as sure. JiraSoft mentioned it? Will it be able to be, uh, well, is it multi-currency aware? Uh, will it be able to provide us with least cost routes when it sees that uh, the route to Bix is maybe more expensive than via PCW to South Africa, for example. So, uh, so, so, so we analyzed, we did a, a lot of research and, and going into the depth and meeting with the uh, engineers and speaking to them how this will integrate. Will it be able to support geo redundancy? Will it support the various uh, uh, pro species? Uh, elements on its own. By the way, we've got about, uh, when we get to the drawing, we've got about eight, eight old, uh, pro species, so it's four clusters. So all eight of them is directly integrated into Gerasoft. And uh, and uh, when we decided to start going off with Gerasoft, um, and, and it was the only, it was the, why Gerasoft? It was actually the only, there is other products, but it was the only product that we could see from your partner list that was doing the billing. So I said, look, we already have a good experience with ProSBC. Let's see how we can fit in Gerasoft in our picture. And my relationship with, with Gerasoft was quite good at, the, at that stage. So I said, let's take, the, take it to the next level. And that's how we, sure. we started with, with the Gerasoft and said, let's, sure. uh, let's, let's take it to the next level. Good. So Mike, I'm going to kind of toss it at you a little bit here. Is um, mm -hmm. you know what about the Gerasoft offering that really was unique that was really able to help Ricky and his uh, his efforts? I, Rick is, I think Rick has spoke to me and uh, figured that I'm the right person, and that's it. <laughs> um, in in reality, um, the way we built our company and the way we built our company from day one uh, has been specifically to help customers like Paredes. Um, and the way the company came to be in 2005 is we had our own little transit uh, wholesale business uh, in Europe. And at the time we couldn't find uh, a decent billing solution. We've tried a few. And so we created our own billing solution, which is usually the famous last words of any company that tries to do it, we created our own billing solution and then struggled to support it forever. Ours turned out to be pretty good and not only we used it internally, uh, we figured that it's a solution that market would be interested in and uh, started offering, to, offering it to the market in 2005. Mm -hmm. uh, because of that background, we sort of understand what is important and what is not. And it got into a point where we wound down the wholesale business side and uh, we became purely a billing solution company. 
the importance here, as I said, is to understand what customers like Paratus need, what their pain points are, and essentially what is it that can help them concentrate on their business rather than concentrating on integrations, on billing solutions, on SBC, on switches, and so on and so forth. So from our standpoint, I think we fit very well on two fronts with Paratus. One is is our approach to things, make a product, support the product, make it easy, make it intuitive. The other one is we partner very well with switches and specifically with Telco Bridges. Um, one of the things, I've spoken to Telco Bridges for the first time probably seven, eight years ago, maybe longer than that. And we clearly understood that both companies have very similar approach and very similar philosophies as to how to service customers. Uh, we talk to each other if there is any issue, if there is any uh, integration issue between the company, we solve it quickly. And I think Ricky would be um, a good point to sort of comment on this as to if there is any problem, how both companies jump both feet in to solve those problems quickly instead of, and this is extremely important, instead of playing a blame ping pong, this is their problem, no, this is their problem. As partners and as close partners, I think we work extremely well together with Telco Bridges and of the customers we've had over the years. Um, I don't think I heard anybody complaining that, you know, it's not well integrated or it's not well supported as a, entity as a overall unit rather than two separate boxes and two separate products. So that's my sort of thought on the subject. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a perfect segue to the next little section here, which is talking about how they work together from a technical side. So uh, I think you did a good job explaining uh, the, the relationship. So um, you'll enjoy this. So I, 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 at one point or another, I asked Ricky, I said, hey, Ricky, can you send over a network diagram the, so we can talk about how your network uh, works together. So he sent me this. <laughs> and we spent about a half an hour of him explaining to me what all these different layers are and all these different clouds are. And I said, R Ricky, yesterday, uh, explain it to me like I'm a fifth grader. And uh, this is, then he came up with this, which I think makes a lot more sense for a lot of people. We can skip back if we need to. But so Ricky, just walk us through real quick um, how this, how your network is architected, how the SPCs and Jirasoft work together, and then uh, and, and we could maybe take some questions and answers as, as we go along here. Okay, thank you, Alan. Uh, okay, the first thing that you need to know is each and every design always starts from a requirement. So like I mentioned, I mentioned a couple of the requirements at the beginning, I mentioned some of the things of Pro SBC, uh, I mentioned that uh, one of the requirements was to uh, increase stability in the environment. The other uh, requirements on the Jerasso side was a multi currency, uh, the root away, the, uh, the vendor awareness, and also the customer layer awareness. So, um, and then the last part was basically geo redundancy because it was one of our MD's requirements or the MD requirements that. It must be jury done and we need to make sure that we can facilitate our customers, those that are connected to both uh, the Punis Park side and the headquarters side. As you can see, I mentioned Punis Park um, on, in the middle on the left and in, in, in the middle on the right headquarters. So, uh, so yeah, uh, we needed to have a jury done set up and we need okay. to be able to manage uh, the customers from a centralized system. And that's where Gen Gerasoft came in. It was one centralized system and it can manage all four clusters. So uh, to give you a quick rundown, um, uh, basically all our customers, we, we, we try to design it in a class four and a class five layer. And a class four terminology refers more to the wholesale layer where you will have your wholesale minutes, your minutes going to your interconnect vendors, uh, uh, local partners like Telecom, MTC, all our uh, local telecommunication providers here in Namibia. And then uh, <clears throat> your class five is your customer layer. That's where it will be more 
customer aware. If we know who exactly is making the call, what is the number of the subscriber, how do I terminate the call to that to to that subscriber or customer premises? Is it by IP or do I just drop it to the hosted PBX, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So and um, those are routing decisions that needs to be made. So Gerasoft is making all those routing uh, decisions for us over the radius, as you can see in the red lines, it's the stating radius. It's doing all those routing decisions for us based on where the subscriber is, et cetera. So at the customer layer where you see at the bottom subtrunks, uh, normally subtrunks is offered to like huge corporate companies that is having their own PBXs, IP PBXs. And if they make a call, they can either, their system will either make the call either to our headquarters customer cluster or the PPK customer cluster. So it will either get one of the two. As soon as it reads the HQ cast, uh, let's say, for example, it will reach the HQ cast cluster. At that stage, ProSPC will ask Gerasoft, I have this customer, can he make a call? Who is the customer? Then um, not necessarily who is the customer. Gerasoft will identify the customer. It will look at the credit. Does the customer have any credit available? Uh, is he allowed to make this call, etc.? As soon as uh, Gerasoft identify that, then Gerasoft will look at the at its routing table. Uh, can it can it can it make the call to which part uh, to which systems it needs to make the call? The reply back from Gerasoft will be an authorization message coming back to HQCast, and it will tell HQCast you can go to either HQ call or PPK call. We giving Gerasoft is giving us both those, so it's for redundancy purposes. Can either go to HQ core and it's in a load balancing fashion. So sometimes the calls will go to PPK core, sometimes the call will go to HQ core. It's now the class four layer. So, uh, so it's quite well balanced. At that stage, the call has already been authorized. So we know the customer, we can send out a call, we just don't know where is the destination going to be. Uh, is the destination South Africa? What interconnects are we going to use? And that's where we end up to the pro PC clusters inside the class four layer. So at that stage of the class four layer, the system will again ask Gerasoft, I have received the call. This is a call and I've received it from HQCast. So it will identify this HQCast and I have received this call where can I send the call? So if the number is 0027, which is South African prefix, basically, it will start evaluate all the codes and it will identify all the vendors in a least cost routing or depending on the algorithm that you set. You can also set it based on uh, best quality of services uh, that the vendor provide. So it will now, uh, currently we have set it on least cost routing. So it will provide and it will tell you if you send the call through PCCW, it will be uh, one cent. If you send it to uh, Bigs, it will be two cent. If you send it through Liquid, it will be three cent, for example. See, and all those routes are being sent over the authorization, the radius uh, line that you see there in the two HQ core, uh, pro specific cluster that will have all the routes. And it will not tell, try to, to reach the destination with a failover mechanism. If route one is not successful, it will fail over to the second to the second cheapest route, and it will go down the line until it tries to complete the call. Eventually, the blue lines, as you can see, is basically where my media traffic, my real sub traffic, uh, RTP traffic, is running. And then from that class four layer, you will see uh, there's a blue line showing all the way to the interconnects. And that interconnects can now be our telecom local partners. It can be. Uh, anyway, it can be big, it can be right over the, the world. We've got bigs, we've got PCCW, we've got Liquid, we've got Telcom SA, we've got Vodacom uh, SA. So, so then the call will be sent in and they will then deliver the call, basically. After all the calls are being finished, then the second step comes in usually. That's where we do radius accounting. And all the accounting messages is sent over the same link to Gerasol in order to do the rating so uh, in the billing. So it will then look at, oh, the customer is well, in the rate sheet for this customer is now five Namibian dollars per minute for the destination to South Africa. So I have to charge a customer $5 and it will rate the CDRs. 
What Gerasoft also do, uh, what is quite interesting, what, what it also does uh, quite instinctively is it will predetermine the amount of seconds that you have for a certain destination. And it will also send the seconds, the amount of seconds to pro USB-C. Say, for example, if you're running low and you only have 10 bucks, it will tell pro USB-C you only have 120 seconds of the call. So what pro USB-C, pro USB-C take that information, that's on the authorization part, and it will just allow that call for 120 seconds. So that ensures some sort of real-time billing in our whole environment. And doesn't matter where the call originated from, whether it's from PPK, Penis Park, or headquarters, it can terminate at either headquarters call or PPK call, and it will go out to the interconnect. And that's our jury done as an architect here in Namibia. Yeah, quite a, quite a elegant architecture. And the one thing I also wanted to point out too is uh, we, we talked about some of the transcoding requirements and that uh, you've got a couple of blocks on the diagram here. Maybe just real quick mention you know, why transcoding and, and what are those little boxes in the uh, architecture? Yeah, um, we've got a couple of customers running on G729 uh, and I think some of our interconnects also over the internet prefer also G729. And it's so much easier just to transcode it on your own instead of uh, telling the customer now you have to change code it because some of our customers is Satan on G729 only. They run over satellite. So we've got right. uh, customers that are sitting at lodges and stuff and uh, we have to use the lowest bandwidth protocol like G729. And now you can't renegotiate the G711 protocol so the call gets dropped. The transcoder just help to translate. It's almost like translating English to Afrikaans if we have a translator in that. So translated from one code at G711 to G729 or G729 to G722 or G722 to AMR, uh, is it AMR or something? But yeah, all, all, all the various uh, transcoders. We got dedicated boxes from Telco Breaches. So it's dedicated boxes that is available. And, uh, and we've integrated it with our core pro SBCs in a redundant fashion. Good. And then before we move on from the diagram here and start to talk about results, so Mike, is there is there anything special in this? Is this is this a standard offering for Jerisoft? Is there maybe this is a, a great diagram that conceptually um, I explain to customers usually this way. If you look at this diagram and imagine a phone call as a customer wanting to get from point A to point B in a car. So you think about, okay, I have a car, I have a road, I have traffic signals, I have traffic control of some sort, and I need to get from point A to point B. Um, in this metaphor, so to speak, uh, SBC is the road. The call itself is the customer trying to get from somewhere to somewhere. And Jarosoft decides, A, how do I get from this point to this point? Because there are many roads to get there. Once I get from this point to this point, how much is going to cost me? Are those toll roads? Are those free roads? Each road costs different amount of money. And so here, conceptually, so it's easier to understand, uh, Ricky is getting the customers from place to place. Let's say they call from Namibia to London. Telco Bridges provides a road, so to speak, which connects the call physically, connects the data, connects the uh, media from place to place. And Gerasoft provides traffic signals and sort of route to get the customer from one place to the other place in the most efficient, the least expensive, the most quality way possible. Sure. Uh, and at the end, the Gerasoft rates the uh, ride, so to speak, and says, okay, for this particular call, this is the amount of money that customer owes to Paredes, and this is the amount of money that Paredes owes to the vendor that they've chosen to uh, get the customers through, and that's part of our dynamic routing book. We'll talk about a bit more later on. Sure. So that's my sort of view, overview. <laughs> good, good. 
All right, let's talk about some results here. <clears throat> so, Ricky, maybe give us a, you know, where, where do you stand today? How, how has this worked out? You know, what are some of the benefits for uh, Paratus at this point? Yeah, um, first, uh, the the biggest, and gratefully, the biggest benefit that we got out of this is that all geo redundancy set up and the uh, capability of Gerasoft to be able to manage each of those gateways individually. The OSBC gateways, if I have to call it like that, the SBCs, mm -hmm. the SBCs individually. And it's specifically SBC aware. So, so yeah. And um, what, what the results have been, um, we have seen that our billing and, and the billing records that we obtained started to synchronize more with that of our vendors, especially when you buy international vendors, they have to double check whether this is what we're charging them is right, or we have to double check on our billing system whether this is right, uh, what they are charging us. And that was with minimal, maybe a minute or minute two uh, deviation with the new setup, with the old setup, I don't know what happened there. Maybe we lost some, a couple of JSON CDRs or somewhere something went wrong. But with this one, it's near perfect. We don't have discrepancy at all, uh, uh, minute discrepancies. And that is the way that the hang up of a call happens. If I hang up a call here, maybe a millisecond later, it's hanging up on the other side or, or, or the latency distance between my, uh, my hang up and the and the hang up signal that is getting to the partners, uh, SPC and billing system, etc. So, so those are the things. Um, so uh, the other part of the result is uh, we used to experience also suboptimal routing with our old setup. So for some other reason, when I mean suboptimal routing, I'm, I'm talking about that sometimes uh, this um, in the older system we ended up to send calls on the expensive routes instead right. of so we started to lose revenue by sending calls on the expensive routes and uh, we also struggled to maintain the loads of rates on the older system uh, uploading continuously pix is sending out new rates almost every second week the same with orange the same with pcdw and we had to upload because rates are changing and it feels almost like you're watching the exchange rate uh, at a forex, a forex exchange rate, it's mm. change change like this to borrow uh, your call to South Africa is one one Namibian dollar. The day after tomorrow, it might be two Namibian dollar through Pix and all these kind of things. So we needed to have this kind of system that is more aware and try to save us cost. And we're actually saving us cost with uh, the Jeras of the analysis. They completely. Uh, uh, how can I say, a destination, the digits aware, because as PCW will say, for example, a number that is having eight digits, two, seven, eight, one, 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 will cost you one dollar. But if you send to the rest of South Africa, two, seven, that will cost you two dollars. So you need to be able to, to notice when the subscriber is calling this eight digit, it needs to go to the one dollar rate instead of the, right. uh, or the, the, the more expensive rate and, and those are kind of the, the, the results that we have seen. So mainly in terms of benefits, um, I would say it's jury done and we realize jury done and we can connect our customers to both platforms and it's recognized on both pros PC uh, units uh, from a Gerasoft. Gerasoft is just one customer that you create as long as you have the IP address or the ANI is configured, then Gerasoft will recognize that subscriber and link it to its quota. Uh, if I talk about quota, I'm talking about the balance that the customer is having uh, left. Uh, the other benefits is real-time billing. So we could immediately cut off a call when it exceeds its uh, limits. Our customer is having uh, their set limits. So, so that's another benefit. And one of the previous benefits that I mentioned was the least cost routing part also, sure. that we also realized a lot, a lot, actually a massive of cost savings. Because uh, as soon as the call, as soon as we upload the rate sheet, that is more, and, and that specific rate of call 
is more expensive when we charge our customer. Jira mm-hmm. Soft will alert us and it will block the call so that we can make the necessary adjustments. And here in Namibia, we always have, if, if we do the rate changes for our customers, we always have to uh, cassette it with the regulator. So it's actually quite a process, extensive mm-hmm. process when it comes to that, that side of the game. And we need to be aware of this in order to control our costs. Got it, got it, good. Well, it sounds like it's worked out well for you. Yes. Um, yeah, we had one question pop in here. It's kind of an architecture question. So before we go on too far, we get into the solutions. Let's just skip back for a second, kind of ask a question about the architecture. So uh, John asked a question about um, encryption. You know, where and in, 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 are you leveraging encryption in the network? And if so, where? So I'm going to skip back to that diagram real, real quick. And maybe you can answer that question, Ricky. Okay. At the moment, we don't, uh, we didn't implement any encryption. Mm-hmm. As soon as it gets uh, enforced by our regulator, we will do it. But uh, what I can tell you from my side is, uh, based on my research on ProSBC, they already support secure RTP and all the certificates and stuff in order to enable this encryption. If I have to enable encryption, I will basically make sure that encryption always happens when I go over the internet. I wouldn't mind much when the subtrunks is directly from Parata. So, so as soon as I go over the internet to our other sub interconnects, or even if we've got clients, uh, like the clients over satellite that is going, going over the internet, I will start doing uh, the SRTP if, right. it, if, it's, if it's enforced. Uh, but that is, for now, the RTP route was a, was a bit simpler, to be honest. Yeah, oh, no. yeah. Well, if it's on your private network, obviously you control that. But you yeah. know, as you mentioned, when you're out on the internet, that's the place to do it. And as you mentioned, yeah. you know, Pro SBC does support uh, encryption on you know either side or either leg or both. So um, yeah, the resources are there for you to use it now. Good. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let's move on to talk um, about some of the solutions. Um, Mike, I've included here a couple of slides. We are running a little long, so I'm going to have to kind of right. make sure you keep moving here. But uh, we'll maybe give it just a quick overview of some of the solutions you've got from Jerasoft. Okay, I'll try to run through it quickly. Um, essentially, Jerasoft uh, is right now able to do billing for uh, retail and wholesale VoIP, both prepaid and postpaid. Uh, we can do uh, SMS billing. We can do billing for MVNOs, billing for IoT, which we have several customers for. Uh, billing for OTT, we have several large customers doing OTT on their end, uh, business telephony, SIP trunk and um, retail to end users or to companies, uh, PBX and so on. Uh, so both the important part is both prepaid and postpaid is supported and both retail and wholesale is supported. Good. Next slide, please. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And then why Gerasoft? Um, so why Gerasoft? Uh, because I'm here. Um, <laughs> the company, as I mentioned, is purely an engineering company. Uh, so everybody in the company, um, pretty much everybody in the company, myself included, are either current or former engineers. And we view the world from that standpoint. How do we help our customer with technical solution and let them do their business? So uh, it says we provide billing for 12 years. It must be a very old slide. We actually have been around since exactly June of 2005. So it's 18 years now. Uh, there is about 265 clients plus right now in about 42 different countries on all continents other than Antarctica. Uh, there is um, custom configurations available for our uh, solution. Um, you can have several different modules. So we're trying to create a solution specifically for your needs. Uh, your size of business, in other words, we ask you how many customers you have, how many minutes you run per month, how much data, and then we discuss your needs for redundancy. As Ricky mentioned, both geo-redundancy and regular redundancy. We discuss whether you need dynamic routing, whether you need rates management, uh, whether you need CDR dispute management, and so on. So there's custom licenses and options. Um, Support is the most important thing we provide. We have 24 seven support engineers available and have the company is our support department. Yep. Been like that from day one and it's extremely yep. important to us. 
Uh, the support can be done via email, usually via our ticketing system, but can also be done via chat or a phone call if needed. Uh, we do training for every customer. We do live training. Follow-up sessions are available with our applications engineers. Onboarding, we make applications engineers available to answer questions, to help out. Our idea is to have you running as fast as possible and as painlessly as possible, especially with help of partners like Telco Bridges, uh, our our partners in uh, on the switch sides. Good. And I, I think it maybe you can add another logo to your client slide with the with Paratus, right? Paratus. Again, it's uh, I have to talk to our marketing people. As I said, we're an engineering company. I see Quantum here, which hasn't been around for a while. Yeah. Uh, GenBand, which was our big customer, we had a, a pretty large, um, pretty large uh, common platform together, but they got yeah. swallowed by uh, Sonos and its ribbon now. So we need to add Paratus, and we need to add uh, Ricky's. Uh, statement on uh, how good we are but essentially yeah. the idea is as i said we have customers worldwide and uh the way we are set up we help you with your business and uh take care of technical things the same way that telco bridges does as well yep and they can get a hold of you here at info at gerasoft.net info is gerasoft.net is the easiest i'm personally based in us so it's gmt plus four i believe nowadays and uh it's either a phone call or a email away, or there's a form on our webpage that you can fill out and send to us. Good. Uh, just a quick overview of some of the session border controller solutions. And of course, the, what, what Rick is using, um, you know, we've got three uh, offers for Pro SBC and Free SBC. Uh, our Pro SBC Plus targeted towards uh, service provider applications uh, with uh, full uh, plus one HA support and 24 seven live support at $2 a session. Our, our mid grade is our pro SBC that um, is targeted towards hosted and enterprise kind of applications with a nine by five support. And uh, that's at a dollar a session. And then as Ricky mentioned earlier, there's also a free SBC, which is really targeted towards like open source educational applications where somebody's just um, using it for a proof of concept or starting to learn. Uh, those are good opportunities. and. And the feature from a feature difference between them all is, uh, you know, this basically add on features when you get to pro SBC, you know, free SBC is definitely feature limited, but the basics are there. Uh, pro SBC adds all that. And the biggest thing with pro SBC plus is the plus one HA license, uh, and also the 24 seven support. So, uh, pretty diverse pro something that fits for everyone, I think at this point. So then the question comes, where do you learn some more? Well, one good place to go is, uh, Ricky mentioned, is our YouTube channel, our uh, library on YouTube at youtube.com slash Telco Bridges. Uh, it's a great place. We've got all kinds of uh, tutorials and past webinars and guest speakers and events like this one today uh, will all be posted there. And uh, we would highly recommend you go there and give us a subscribe. And then you'll be able to uh, capture this kind of content in the future as we go ahead and, and uh, uh, training materials, etc. So that's a great place to go. And with that, um, we're going to kind of wrap up. I know we're getting close to the end here. If you if you have a question, uh, feel free to drop it in here. We got just maybe another minute or so. But other than that, while we're waiting for that, um, Ricky, first I want to just thank you. Um, first of all, for being an awesome customer, and second of all, uh, for um, a, an amazing project that you put together that um, you should be very very proud of. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, and Mike, thanks for your help today with uh, explaining the you know the role of Gerasoft and how you fit into this. And thanks again for being a great partner for all these years, with many more to come. Right. Thank you very much, Alan. I hope so. I've uh, looked at the calendar, and I've personally been in this industry for 19 years, and I'm yeah. trying to think if it's another 19 years, uh, but hopefully <laughs> so. But as the companies, we've always been very good. Uh, partners and uh i thank ricky as well for sort of showing what can be done with this partnership from the uh, customer standpoint and how the customer can benefit from uh, the two companies being true partners with each other true true yep that's great yeah thank you mike 
Yeah, and so I want to thank all of our attendees uh, for spending some time with us today. Um, as noted in the opening, um, uh, opening housekeeping that we'll be uh, sending out an email with uh, uh, all the links to the slides, including the recordings, and that'll all go out most likely tomorrow. Um, so do feel free to share that content with the others in your network that would find it useful. And with that, I'm going to say that's it from here and wishing you all a good day and uh, talk to you in the next webinar. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.